is one of the metals that they've used. And it was first uh, uh, developed in terms of uh, a matrix for bone development. Uh, but then uh, uh, individuals started looking at its ability to provide three-dimensional support, uh, particularly for T-cell development. And the first report was uh, uh, from this group in Nature Biotechnology, uh, where they took mouse thymostromal cells and seeded uh, the structure, and then added uh, human bone marrow progenitor cells, and then uh, they could see production of human T cells out of this uh, three-dimensional structure. Uh, the second study in 2003, using the same type of matrix, seeded mouse stromal cells with uh, uh, selected mouse bone marrow progenitor cells uh, and seeded those into the matrix. And they, again, saw production of mouse T cells and defined uh, different stages of maturation. And then the last study, which is very interesting, uh, was a group uh, uh, here by, uh, led by Clark et al., where they took human fibroblast and keratinocytes and used these as epithelial cell uh, um, surrogates and seeded that onto the matrix and then uh, uh, seeded a, a bone marrow progenitor population and they saw production of human T cells. So this adds very interesting aspect to this where you could potentially uh, have autologous isolated cells from small biopsies, seed a matrix, and then produce a thymus. And this is a very good system uh, in terms of ex vivo. Uh, it's very uh, unlikely that this will be transplanted in, in vivo at any time. But you could produce ex vivo uh, T cells, which and then you could adoptively transfer into an individual. So we took this concept uh, one step further uh, and using a decellarization uh, uh, procedure and looked at uh, the potential uh, of decellarizing a thymus. And again, uh, we uh, uh, used a treatment uh, very similar to uh, Dr. Soker's talk uh, with the liver where we used a, a detergent, Tritex, and then DNAs to uh, remove some of the residual DNA. Uh, that was found. And this shows uh, a, a fresh rat thymus undergoing that decellarization process and produced this type of uh, uh, decellarized matrix here. Uh, with the rat thymus and even mouse thymus, the vasculature is uh, so small it was very hard to cannulate, so we didn't do a perfusion type decellarization process. This was actually uh, a, a a shaking uh, type of decellarization process that we used. Uh, but as you move up into larger animal models, such as pig, uh, it would be very uh, easy to identify the arterial uh, systems, uh, uh, vessels that lead into the thymus, and they're primarily the anterior uh, uh, mammary artery and the uh, superior and inferior uh, thyroid artery that feed into the thymus. So in a larger animal model, you could do that type of uh, uh, perfusion decellarization. So with this, we also looked uh, how efficient we are to get rid of the cells as well as any residual DNA. And uh, 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 so far, we've been able to uh, uh, remove uh, most of the DNA uh, from the scaffold. And this shows uh, uh, what the scaffold looks like. This is the normal uh, rat thymus at a higher power. Again, this is the medulla cortex here. So this is the decellularized thymus that you see here. And this is a higher power, so you can see it, it maintains uh, some of the uh, extracellular matrix structure uh, to the thymus uh, with a, a vessel uh, identified there. And here is a, a scanning EM of, uh, of a normal thymus. And you can see it's packed with developing thymocytes. And this is a higher power with thymocytes here and areas uh, that appear to be uh, epithelioid uh, where these uh, thymocyte sets in these little crevices. 
And here's uh, an example of the decellularized thymus. And here, again, you can see uh, some of the architecture of the extracellular matrix where the uh, thymocytes were setting. So we used uh, uh, these decellularized scaffolds and seeded with thymus epithelial cells and then uh, with uh, T-depleted bone marrow cells uh, in these types of cultures. And again, normal thymus, decellularized thymus, and then this shows uh, some cells that are associated then with the recellularized thymus uh, within this matrix. Um, so we're just at the point now, we're starting to characterize these cells. Um, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, identify different stages of T cell maturation as they develop within this type of uh, matrix system. So what, what's the significance of this uh, thymus tissue uh, engineering? And one of them is the reversal of age-related changes within the thymus. Uh, so we could potentially um, use a xeno scaffold and use autologous uh, cells from the patient and uh, uh, potentially uh, transplant that uh, uh, reseeded uh, scaffold back into the patient uh, to overcome some of the problems associated with aging. The other was an enhanced immune recovery following immune suppression. So this may be important for cancer patients where uh, with uh, uh, radiation chemotherapy uh, 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 uses, uh, you may be able to supplement their immune recovery with uh, a, a, a transplanted uh, tissue engineered thymus. Another potential is within autoimmune dis uh, diseases. You may be able to reset uh, a patient's uh, T cell uh, responses by uh, generating a fresh uh, thymus and transplanting it back into the individual. And another area is through tolerance induction for allograft transplants. So that the potential is that you can generate epithelial cell populations from both the donor and the recipient, seed that thymic structure, and then uh, 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 use bone marrow from the recipient. And those cells should then be tolerant not just peripheral tolerance, but central tolerance uh, to any allograft, liver, kidney, whatever you want to put in uh, for that graft um, because of that positive and negative selection process that occurs within the thymus, you would generate T cells that would not recognize that donor organ. So all these are possibilities. We just need to, to further characterize the uh, scaffold system and the, the T cell generation uh, ex vivo uh, procedures that we have ongoing. And uh, thank you. I, I like, I'm happy to answer any questions. So we have six minutes for questions. Yes, there are thymus transplants being done. Uh, they're actually being done at Duke University. Uh, there's a group there that uses uh, patients that have DeGeorge's syndrome. And DeGeorge's syndrome is where they do not develop a thymus at all. And these patients usually die by the age of two years, of, uh, two years old. And what they've done is they've taken donor thymus. So uh, when uh, pediatric patients go in for a heart uh, uh, surgery, they usually just remove the thymus from these uh, kids. And so they take that donor tissue and they slice it, thin slices, and culture it for one to two to three weeks. And then they transplant it into the muscle, the thigh of the recipient patient. So they just do an open surgery, open up uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the thigh, place the thymic uh, um, slice within that, and they actually uh, get T cell production for these patients and they can survive. So they are actually being done and this is an aloe setting. So they're taking an aloe donor and using thymic slices to, to transplant. The function of uh, immune cells um, is, a, is a bit of a problem in this sort of a, a model because the 
progenitor cells from the bone marrow come in at a certain place and then progress through the thymus. Um, how do you think you're going to model this in an in vitro system where you're uh, essentially are just reconstituting in a culture? What we'd like to do is um, get away from the static seeding uh, that we have right now and actually do perfusion seeding. And you can uh, then perfuse the uh, uh, endothelial cell, the vascular system, and then you can seed uh, the epithelial cell populations. And uh, what you may then uh, do is, uh, if this is going to be autologous, is that you can seed epithelial cells ex vivo and then transplant that uh, ex vivo generated uh, thymus in vivo, hook up the, the vasculature, and just let the patient's bone marrow cells seed it, just like it normally would occur during development. So you wouldn't have to actually seed the bone marrow progenitor cells ex vivo. You could let uh, it occur in vivo. You would need to, to seed the epithelial cells. And what would probably happen uh, is that you would have this uh, more uh, uh, of an immature epithelial population because they can't fully mature without the presence of the, the developing uh, thymocytes. So once uh, you transplant that, reseed by the patient's bone marrow cells, you would probably get uh, concomitant maturation both of the thymocytes as well as the epithelial compartments. Yeah. Uh, your approach is really quite interesting in the sense that you could just um, use a uh, reconstitutive thymus, a uh, seeded thymus, in an old patient. One concern that, that I have is that uh, the thymus is very dependent on the endocrine environment. You know, there is a time window, perinatal time, time window, where the neuroendocrine system is quite critical for the maturation of the immune system. Uh, if you graft a, a neonatal thymus, of an animal, in an adult animal, it will just last a month or so, and then because the endocrine environment is not right, it will just uh, in body again. So this would be a problem to deal with if we just refuse to extract thymuses in old or adult patients. It, it potentially is a problem. One of the things that's uh, very unique about these natural scaffolds is that you can absorb a number of molecules directly into the scaffold. Uh, so you could use some of the growth factors that, we, uh, that I mentioned in terms of keratinocyte growth factors, some of the uh, factors that you, uh, neuroendocrine types of uh, factors. You could uh, uh, have those absorbed within the scaffold itself and they may provide the microenvironment necessary to get things initiated uh, until you get a full functioning thymus in vivo. Uh, quick question. How old are the mice, uh, the rats, um, when you take their thymuses for decellularization? Uh, these that, that we took uh, uh, were, were donor rats, and they, they were ranged from age anywhere from uh, uh, two to, to three months of age. So, and what we need to do is actually see, uh, uh, does it make a difference? Can you take a young thymus and an old thymus and you can compare, uh, you, can, you, you can look at the ability of old epithelial populations, old bone marrow. So you could do a lot of combinations ex vivo uh, within a system like this to see uh, what potential problems that you're going to see uh, from aged versus young. But you basically decided to settle on the uh, three to four months. Well, right now, as sure. proof of concept, we, we, we wanted to have the best chance, and so we picked a young, young thymus. Thank you. Okay, we have 19 minutes left for the coffee break.